Well, my clock shows that it has turned one o'clock and I know that some folks will just keep logging in as we, as we get going, but I know we have lots to cover in the next hour and I want to give our um, panel the most time possible to do that. So I want to welcome folks to Will's World Shorts. My name is Melissa McLimans. I am a library strategist and consultant at Will's, and I'm excited to share more about social, social work concepts in libraries with you today. Today's shorts will explore what social work in and with the library looks like, why some libraries consider it, as well as the benefits and challenges. You'll hear how to apply social work concepts no matter your budgetary constraints, common models of library social work partnerships, and how these programs are tailored to unique community needs. And sharing all of this important information with you today are our three guest speakers. First, I'd like to introduce you to Ashley Sedano. Uh, she is a library social worker at the Racine Public Library. She is a first-generation college graduate, graduate who earned her BA from Carthage College in 2019 and a master in social work from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2021. Prior to Racine Public Library, she worked as a bilingual service coordinator for a birth to three agency. Her volunteer and internship experience include homeless shelters, food and clothing pantries, an inpatient psychiatric hospital for adolescents, a residential addiction treatment center, and a family and aging center, amongst many others. This wide variety of experience confirmed Ashley's interest in true general social work practice. Being the first full-time social worker on staff at Racine Public Library has allowed Ashley to hone in on her passion for creating an inclusive space for all while navigating the unique challenges of library social work. Thanks for being here, Ashley. It's great to see you. We're also joined today by Debbie Minsky Kelly, who is the field director and clinical assistant professor at Carthage College School of Social Work. Debbie's 25 plus year career as a social worker includes leadership in mental health and addiction treatment with children, teens, and families most recently as director of a mental health facility. Debbie's background includes work in child welfare, domestic violence, homeless health care, private practice, and childhood trauma. Debbie has presented at local, national, and international conferences and has published research in the area of the healthcare system's response to domestic violence and on the ethical questions raised by social workers embracing the medical model of mental health delivery. Debbie has select, was selected as Distinguished Teacher of the Year at Carthage in 2021 and has a strong interest in ethical practice related to trauma and resilience based on her teaching of a semester course on trauma to undergraduate students in 2019. Welcome, Debbie. We're so glad that you're here. And finally, we have Libby Richter, who holds a master's degree in social work, mental health from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She was hired by the Public Library in Eau Claire um, in 2019, becoming the first social worker hired in a library in Wisconsin. She works with customers to help them overcome challenges in their daily lives. She has led a team that focused on creating systemic change to end homelessness and continues to serve on various committees addressing mental health, housing, and food insecurities in the community. She has worked in libraries since she was 16, has jumped at the opportunity to combine her passions, and enjoys sharing this passion with others. We're so glad to have you here, Libby, um, to spend some time with us. Um, I am going to pass the mic over to our panelists at this point. We will be monitoring um, chat for questions, but most of the questions will be at the end. So um, feel free to jot them down um, either in chat or just you know on a pad of paper next to you. And we will definitely have time for questions at the end of the presentation. I'll let you take it away. Yes, are you getting us started? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today to talk about social work concepts in libraries. Today's learning objectives 
are to understand the role of social workers in libraries, recognize the shared values between social workers and library settings, analyze the challenges and opportunities presented by locating social work services within a library setting, and to develop pathways for similar services to be considered in their communities. So we can go to the next slide. So we're going to start today by kind of talking about the background and the shared history of the social work and library professions. Um, we, we This is really important to talk about because I think that because we have such a deep embedded shared history within the two professions, it kind of makes for a very natural combination and coordination to have. And it just makes sense to kind of combine those two to be able to serve the public, which is really the goal of both professions. So both social work and library careers, jobs, profession emerged in the 1800s, and both fields as frontline workers tended to be female, whereas leadership roles were more often filled with men, and we can see that embedded throughout the beginning of both of those professions. Around the 1850s, some key events took place, such as the Hull House being founded, which offered social services to the community. And some of those services included legal aid, employment services to the community, childcare, training and crafting and dom domestic skills. And all while this is happening, Melville Dewey founded the ALA. The first library degree was completed at Columbia College and the library journal was also launched. So a lot of this, I'm sure you all know, um, but it's also really interesting to see how both are kind of embedded in the same history. There are, because of that, we can see that both of these professions emerge around these social movements to provide access of resources and information to folks. And it's really neat to see how these historical roots shared among social workers and librarians contributed to very similar values those values being commitment to creating services accessible to all, an emphasis on promoting the public good, prioritizing community health and well-being, and a commitment to individual rights such as autonomy, self-determination, privacy, and confidentiality. And similarly, many ethics are shared between social workers and librarians, such as the dedication to service, privacy and confidentiality, access to information, respect for rights, professional skills, integrity, and social justice. Library social work presents many unique opportunities because the library is a space that is one of the few that provides information and services in a free and accessible space with a lack of stigma associated with it. It's one of those things, like I said before, that just makes sense. Having a social worker share that space provides even more access to needed resources and bridges the gaps that appear in many social service and nonprofit organizations and even government systems. Other opportunities that it has is providing services regardless of age, gender, race, citizenship, income, insurance coverage, the ability to develop programmings, programming needs to meet those community needs, policies and practices that can be examined through a social justice lens in the library, and also to bring awareness of issues such as mental health and trauma to a government agency. We can go to the next slide. We'll soon go more into depth on different partnership types and social work programs in libraries, but it's really important to keep in mind that there are some challenges that may come up. One of those is the need or lack of need for documentation. Um, it's important to note that every community is different and every city, town, or even state may have different requirements, but Social workers also have their own standards to abide by. So this is a very important piece of the conversation when thinking about implementing social work services in a library setting, especially when libraries also hold patron privacy to what it seems like an even higher standard than social workers. So having those dialogues from the get-go is crucial when hiring a social worker in the, in the library. Some library social workers that I've seen now um, from speaking to library social workers across the country have very different documentation that they keep. Some have very extensive case notes that kind of follow more of case management style, whereas some just have spreadsheets that just track needs and demographics so that there's no um, personal data that they keep track of. So it really just depends on community needs, the social work program that each library develops. And that's why it's really important to have those conversations from the get-go. 
Um, other challenges within a library social work um, collaboration is that community need may exceed social work capacity. It's really important to, um, and I think I also skipped, so the, the two kind of go hand in hand, that the community need may exceed social work capacity and that the potential for reducing librarians' role in, ad in addressing community needs by just simply any time that any social service need comes into the library, it's just the social worker will handle that. That is a referral for the social worker. So it's really important to kind of have a balance between both and have that communication between staff and the social worker from the get-go. Uh, a really cool example is that the social worker can create a general resource binder or sheet for staff to refer to for a quick reference questions and staff can then be instructed to only refer patrons to the social worker that show um, significant need for referral access and assistance beyond just answering a simple question. Like I said, every community is different, and that goes into the, the next point that community need may exceed the capacity of a social worker. It's really important to understand that a social worker is also only one person and cannot solve your city's or county's homelessness, poverty, or employment crisis, and there should be practices and expectations in place to support the social worker because it can be overwhelming due to the lack of standardized protocols and answers within library social work. Um, library social work has been around for quite some time, but it's not that common. And there, there is a lack of protocols and standardization in this career. So it's really important to have those conversations to be able to acquire and standardize the process for that specific community and library. Where we are now and the future directions for library social work, like I said, every community is different. So what you, you will all learn more about our specific social work programs in later slides. Um, a quick cool fact is that the first full-time social worker in a library was hired in San Francisco in 2009. And it's my understanding that she's still there to this day. So that's pretty neat. And it's a growing profession. The whole person librarianship is a really cool resource. Uh, wholepersonlibrarianship.com has a map. It's an interactive map that gets updated very frequently that shows all of the social work collaborations with libraries. So you can kind of see where they're located, what their programs look like. And as of this year, there are 300 library social work partnerships. And like I said, it's a growing trend. So it's, it's very neat to see for sure. So, um, you know, we hear a lot you know, from people, you know, like we want a library social worker too, you know, things like that. And um, why, why do we want a library social worker as well? Um, you know, I. I want to be very clear too that, you know, as, as social workers, um, we are here to do a lot of proactive work. I think a lot of people think social worker when they're thinking about reactivity and some, and we can definitely, you know, help with some of that and help be guiding, you know, guide in some of that. Um, but I want to be clear too, that a lot of what we do is the goal is to try to prevent things from escalating, prevent things from getting to a point um, where, um, you would need further interventions or whatever else. So um, that is one thing I want to make very clear as well. Um, and it's in a very uncomfortable process as well. It, this whole idea of having a social worker shakes up as you know, Ashley just talked a lot about histories and all of that. And it changes the way people have been doing things and changing the status quo is hard. It's hard for us too. Um, and it's hard for libraries as well. So understanding that you know, if if you're interested in signing up for a type of collaboration, it's going to be a challenging process for everybody. And everybody's going to have to work hard on challenging their thinking and challenging their viewpoints. Um, so you may be thinking like, yes, I want to help staff save time, or I want to help, you know, get serve people better. I want to serve people, you know, uh, I want to serve the whole person. Great. We're, we love to hear that. That is so exciting. Um, but I just want to also say, it's going to be a challenge and be prepared to be challenged, but it's going to hopefully turn your community into a better place because of it. And that is such an exciting thing that we've seen um, over and over and over again for people as this profession continues to grow. So understand that there's a lot of things that we can do to further enhance um, what your library is doing and helping fill those unmet needs. So how do you actually get a social worker? So, um, <laughs> or some kind of other alternative, because we understand budgetary constraints are huge. Um, a lot of people are feeling it this year. Uh, it's budget season right now, from my understanding. Thankfully, I don't have to be super invested in that. Um, but uh, I understand this is a very stressful time and people think, how do we do this? You know, because uh, this arrow on the side here roughly indicates 
um, level of cost. It roughly indicates level of intervention, though, as well. You know, the more money you put into it, the more intervention you're probably going to get out of this. But not always the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, a full-time social worker in the library, library system, or shared by the city are all different types of models that we've seen. Uh, there's actually a city in Texas that for quite a while shared their social worker between um, emergency response and the city and the library. So, I mean, there's alternative ways to be able to potentially share these positions. Um, the library systems, we see a lot of social workers that are in library systems are one, you know, always concern about that too, is making sure people are not spread too thin uh, because we want to make sure people are doing effective work and not just being present and, uh, you know, not able to do that in-depth work that they might need to do. That funding can come from um, grant funding or city funding, uh, like library system funding. Uh, we've also seen people who are duly trained as a librarian and a social worker. So if there's opportunities for continuing education, potentially there's someone on staff that's interested in uh, engaging and furthering their education, which is great. And we've also seen a lot of libraries too that do um, you know, part-time as a option as well, because that's a little bit easier on the income sometimes moving in, um, and maybe they're able to prove over time and bump that position up. We've seen that happen quite a bit. Contracted positions are also quite common. Um, this can be from a lot of different entities. We've seen it with hospitals um, and Department of Human Services probably most commonly. Uh, a lot of hospitals do have like community health grants, things like that, where they're trying to help out. And they're even willing to sometimes say like, we will employ the person, we will pilot the program in the library for a couple of years. Um, but just know that that funding, of course, is going to end. So think about the fact that maybe that's not sustainable long term. And how are you going to sustain things after that? We've unfortunately in our time uh, seen quite a few programs end because of lack of funding, lack of um, continuing of support for those programs. So that's hard, right? Because we see a lot of great work happening and then it cuts off. And that vital community resource that people were getting used to and counting on to be able to get connected to services has now disappeared. But hopefully a lot of these programs I've seen have at least set up uh, the foundation and the scaffolding for better support for the library and better support for referrals and everything else. So keep those things in mind. Peer navigators are a really common trends. Um, they're being called more peer support specialist these days. And a lot of states, including Wisconsin, do have some specialized training programs for peer support specialists and certifications for that. So that is individuals who maybe they don't have a degree in social work. Maybe they don't even have a degree at all, but they uh, maybe have lived experience with um, being homeless or having, you know, facing insecurities or whatever else. Those typically are the um, most sought after peer specialists or the people with lived experience to be able to help other people navigate through these systems. And uh, just understanding you know, who's gonna be supervising those people is also another consideration when it comes to that as well, because they're gonna need some guidance in their work. Someone else who needs supervision are social work interns. We love interns in the social work field. And I wanna further emphasize too here that this is a little bit different than the library world when it comes to internships. Uh, social work internships, both at the bachelor's and master's level, are required, and they are hundreds of hours, and they are critical for us completing our degrees, and we we want to do them, we have to do them. They are a wonderful learning opportunity and a wonderful opportunity, too, for young, you know, young minds, not always young minds, but, you know, typically a lot of people who are fresh in this field who are excited and engaged and want to do change work and all of that. And we see a lot of wonderful things happen with those internship placements. And there are hundreds of those in libraries around the U.S. because, again, they are a lot more attainable because of the funding component. Um, a lot of social work programs, you know, even ask that, they, that interns don't get paid as a part of a standard of their programs. Not all of them, um, but they're in, uh, that is a component of that as well. So understanding that, hey, you know, that might be some, some good way to get some social work experience in your libraries. Service learning students. This is changing, I think, quite a bit university to university, tech college to tech college. But um, some universities still require service learning, require you know, for degrees. This is also even in high school. Sometimes we've seen you know service learning as an opportunity. But again, small projects that you think, and we'll talk more about projects later. But small projects that you want to get going, these might be great opportunities, students of some type, um, to to get into and get started in your libraries. Um, hosting, so this is a little bit different here. Um, there some, are some other ways that you can get social services in your library. Um, you can host social service providers um, for office hours, events, whatever else it may be. Um, so being able to have someone from the Department of Human Services come in, workforce resource come in. And again, I'll talk more about how that could look later. 
that's a great way to have someone come in, do some hours, connect to people, and meet people where they are at. We've also seen some libraries do things like, you know, mental health or physical health clinics. So people being able to come in and get blood pressure checks or do therapy or whatever else in the library setting because of partnerships with hospitals, partnership with colleges again, um, mental health students, nursing students, they, you know, they need to get experience, both of them as well. So opportunities exist there as well. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention to education for staff, you know, that is another way to help grow and help support uh, staff and learn about different ways to connect with people. Um, maybe it is, you know, reference team or, whom, or adult, you know, adult services, whomever it is that is connecting with a lot of populations on resource needs in your community. Maybe it's that, you know, them having someone uh, come in and talk to them from different entities. So they're a better understanding referral sources, better understanding food pantries in the area, whatever it may be. And all of that to say, understanding the gaps and needs and resource needs in your community is important. And, you know, maybe that's you doing a community assessment. Maybe that is, a, you know, working with the university or tech college or someone else to help do a community assessment to see what are the needs in our community and how could we use all of these, uh, you know, entities that I have listed here, you know, to better meet the needs of our community. So, uh, just take that into consideration that every community is a little bit different and what works in my community, what works in Ashley's community um, are all a little bit different and we do things differently because of that. So that is okay. Um, again, because it's budget season, I wanted to just briefly throw in here um, a slide on cost considerations. So I think there's a lot of things that people do consider sometimes like grants, donations, all of that. Um, and for, you know, for money going out, a lot of people think of salary and benefits and that kind of thing. But I don't think the library necessarily knew when they were signing up to have a social worker that um, we might go through a lot of paper. <laughs> we hate that part of our job, but we sometimes go through a lot of paper. Um, or we might use a little bit of postage. Or there's sometimes things like backpacks or bus passes that we want to give out. Um, and where is that money coming from? Those types of things. So considering there's a, some other supply things that could potentially come up um, as needs with having a social worker. The other things too are social workers have some requirements, um, contracts, you know, like supervision, licensing, um, professional liability insurance, professional organizations, continuing education. Not every library is necessarily going to pay for some of these things, um, and that's totally okay. But just knowing that those are hundreds of dollars that your social worker might also be incurring as well in order to get that met. So maybe making sure the salary compensation is, you know, there for that if you're not paying for it or whatever else as well. So. Just some things I wanted to throw in there. I'll move it on to Debbie. Thank you, Libby. So um, we thought um, telling the story of how um, how the Racine's uh, library social worker came into existence um, has a lot of lessons for libraries that might be at different stages of consideration of this type of service line. So um, what was happening, it's in the Racine Public Library. And so this was all like years before Ashley even started in her role. But um, librarians in Racine were increasingly seeing many issues coming through their doors that were beyond their area of expertise. Um, they saw patrons facing housing insecurity. They were seeing unaccompanied minors, elderly patients who appear to, it on first glance, appear to be coming in for technology assistance, but once um, the librarians who are obviously very skilled in those areas were helping them with the technology, it became a little bit more complicated as the patrons were actually trying to access public benefits or facing a lot of isolation or other needs for social services that sort of became a little bit muddy in terms of the original ask, which was just for technology assistance. And then suddenly they're asking the librarian for assistance with all kinds of other things that were beyond um, their knowledge base. So um, understanding that this was not their core um, area of expertise, um, they um, just one sort of very aware librarian who had read the whole person librarianship book, um, she decided to ask her colleagues as well as herself to sort of track like how much time are we spending in our days um, a, a, attending to social service needs. Um, and, you know, they tracked this over a period of months and found that if you kind of added all that time up of the individual librarians 
that this would equate approximately to a full-time position. So at a, around that same time when some of that data collection was happening, um, just by happenstance in 2019, a local NSW student who lived in the Racine area but was attending a, an online social work program um, needed an internship um, in her local community. And so she just kind of like walked into the library and said, hey, would you be interested in having a social work intern? And so this librarian who had taken the strong interest um, in the social service needs thought, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to better understand how this might fit in to our service mix. Um, now, when you um, are considering an MSW intern, it is important to understand that um, a, a, a master's level or above social worker, probably a fully licensed social worker, would be needed as a supervisor. So they were able to partner with um, a local school social worker to provide the supervision for that first master's level intern um, at the Racine Public Library. And so this really began to lay the groundwork of a social work line of service. So the initial services offered by this master's level intern was she developed um, an intake procedure for patrons that were looking for services and she had predictable office hours. So a graduate level internship is usually um, 900 hours um, over the course of a year. So usually about three days a week, um, a, social, a master's level intern would be in a library. So not full time. And so there had to be sort of predictable hours so that patrons could know like when they could come and actually find the, uh, the uh, social work intern there. Um, the social work intern began to develop some community partnerships because the model really was kind of like assess what the needs are and then refer for relevant services in the community. And so, and then uh, she also played a role in kind of introducing to the library team what social work services might look like. So it was such a great success having that first master's level intern that after that, um, this uh, very concerned librarian actually reached out to myself at Carthage because I am the field director for our bachelor's level program. We, don't, we only have a bachelor's level social work program at Carthage. So she wanted to develop an ongoing field partnership between the Racine Public Library and Carthage College social work program. And one of the differences at the BSW level is that there does not have to be a social worker as the supervisor. So it's a little bit easier to have somebody at the library serve as a bachelor's level social work intern supervisor. So our first BSW intern um, went to the Racine Public Library in the 2020 to 21 academic year, which unfortunately was also the pandemic year. And so this was really interesting to have a, a social work intern at a library that was closed for the entire year. But what it allowed for was for that intern to really help to lay more of the groundwork for a social work line of service. So this included um, research and development, development aimed at developing a sensory room, which the library had um, received some grant funding to, to enable them to provide this type of um, service. If you're not familiar with the sensory room, this is intended for sort of neurodivergent individuals, people with trauma histories, et cetera, to have a safe space where they can um, get their sensory needs met. And so um, the social work intern did a lot of research towards that very large project. She began um, providing trainings for library staff on trauma-informed practices and how these might improve the way that libraries respond to patients with higher needs, and also began some research and data collection in the areas related to social justice practice in libraries. So uh, then around this time, there was a change in leadership at the library, as well as a retirement of one full-time librarian. And so then the library sort of went back to that previous time study that showed that the equivalent amount of time on social service needs was about the equivalent of a position of one full librarian. And so with the new leadership and these understandings of the time study, a decision was made and approval was given for a full-time position to be dedicated to a full-time social worker at the Racine Public Library. And so because of my um, support of the internship program and my knowledge of, you know, from the beginning sort of, of how this all evolved, I became 
um, in a consultation role with the library. I assisted with development of the job description. Um, of course, I consulted also with the library social work listserv and got job descriptions from other existing libraries. I served on the interview panel um, when, uh, when we were interviewing various candidates. We discussed scope of practice, ethical concerns um, about, you know, melding the ethics of social work with the ethics of libraries. Um, we had one of our social work faculty members who joined the board of the Racine Public Library to provide additional oversight with this transition. And then Ashley Cedeno, proudly, I will say, a Carthage BSW alumnus, um, was hired and I continue to serve in the role of Ashley's social work supervisor. Um, other areas where we continue to collaborate and grow the program is now Ashley officially supervises our intern. She's supervised so far two different um, Carthage BSW interns. Um, we, Ashley and I collaborate on various training opportunities for library staff. And we assist, I assist Ashley with various networking efforts in support of her role. Um, I've also become um, involved with the Kenosha Public Library, who now also has started a social work internship, um, but they're at, a, at an earlier stage of development. And so this is just something to sort of think about that there are stages of development of the library social work partnership. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, Ashley could now host interns from a variety of different programs. And, um, you know, and this, this could really be exciting because Oftentimes, we've seen in Kenosha serve similar communities. They're, you know, right next door to each other. And so to see the growth of this in a neighboring community is also very exciting. Yeah, so now we're going to go into our specific social work programs and what they look like. Um, I'll personally speak to how it is at the Racine Public Library, and Libya obviously will speak to what it's like at her library. Um, so let's, yeah, we can go ahead to the next slide. So typically in social work, there is three kind of levels of types of social work. There's three levels of care, of practice that you could call it. Um, micro level social work is working directly with individuals or families on everything from access to housing, health care, and social services to treating mental behavior and emotional disorder. So that's working one-on-one -on -one with folks. On a meso level, that's kind of a tier up. It's working with groups and organizations such as schools, businesses, neighborhoods, hospitals, nonprofits, and other small scale communities. And on a macro level, it's working towards large scale systematic change by crafting laws, petitioning governments for community funds, et cetera. So it really is just more so of policy making, lobbying, uh, more so of changing the laws that affect people on the meso and micro level. And the interesting thing is that most, if not all, but I will just say most social work careers kind of focus on one, like you either go into social work to only work with folks one on one or to work in communities in a nonprofit setting or whatever the case is, if it's case management, community building. But one of the things that I love about library social work is that you get to do all three in one. And that's kind of what generalist social work practices is that really it's you're working in general with all three pretty much. And so it's kind of a really nice blend of the three levels of social work that's incorporated in that. And, and that's, I think, what for me personally has drawn me into the profession. Next slide. So specifically what that has looked like at the Racine Public Library on a micro level, I do what I like to call light case management. So it's not full on case management with, with folks where you follow them along a whole process and not do everything for them, but you know, just follow them along with the whole case. But it's more so of light case management of directing folks to resources in the communities, helping out with certain applications here and there. It's more so of just light work, letting them take over their situation, but providing that assistance for them so that they have someone to lean on during that sometimes difficult processes. And like I said, direct resources, uh, handoff while making calls to agencies with them to make those referrals and so that they can get access to those services. 
And then on a mezzo level, it's really important too for library social workers to have those community connections, to know where to refer folks. Towards the first few months of my employment here as a library social worker, I spent a lot of time outside of the library. Almost every day I had meetings with different agencies just to, I kind of had like an, a sort of an intake sheet as well, asking all the questions. What are the requirements for your agencies? How do you access it? What languages does your, do your staff speak? So that way I can get all of the information that I need so that when patrons come in inquiring about those services, I can answer those questions for them. Um, and part of that mezzo level too is those partnerships. It's not just knowing what resources are out there, but collaborating with agencies to bring them into the library or to bring library folks outside in the community so that we can have those collaborations and have a wider reach as well. And on a macro level, it's that systemic change of reviewing policies with a social justice lens. I'll go into depth a little bit more in a few slides, but um, one of the major influences I think of having a library social worker so far here is that we are consistently reviewing our behavior policies and our banning policies to be more equitable for, for, for our community. So again, more in depth on a micro level, I kind of took um, the data that I have that I've collected. So these are just the numbers of what my patron interactions have been since um, I've been at the Racine Library. So patron interactions I consider are appointments, walk-ins or phone calls that result in a referral to a community resource or a direct assistance. And so um, you can see that it steadily has grown. I mean, I've been here for relatively a short time, but you can see even like the jump from, and I would attribute to that, to more community knowing that this that this uh, position even exists because in the beginning it wasn't really well known. But now that it's gotten more traction, now there's been more word of mouth, um, there's definitely a higher um, pattern happening of patron interaction. So, and, and it's been great so far because that, that just goes to show that these positions are needed and that the community really values those because folks need resources. Um, and another program that I run is a free bus pass program. So the free bus passes, we started implementing those in um, September of last year, and they're truly meant to meet social service needs. So with our program, we have set three set days a week and with hour and a half timeframes to distribute those bus passes. And in order to get the free bus pass, you have to show official proof of an appointment that you have. So whether that's a text, an email, or a letter confirmation of a doctor's appointment, dentist appointment, job interview, you just got a job and you need transportation. So it really is to meet those social, those transportation needs that folks have. And ever since we started that program last year, we've given out 951 bus passes. Um, I know Libby touched on funding, so that's a really big thing now, too, because we are in that budget season right now. And so we got our first batch of bus passes last year through ARPA funding. And now that that has run out, the bus passes have consistently been coming out of the library's budget. So that's something that we have to reevaluate now to see where we can get funding for. If Now we have to seek out grants for, for that. And so that's also part of... The, the responsibility of the library social worker to try to see and advocate for those fundings too, because we know that we, we know that in the library world, especially too, in a lot of other professions as well. But um, personally, I, I see it every day that librarians and then the library world were expected to do a lot more with a lot less. And so that's also an important piece when thinking about having a social work program in the library. Again, on a meso level, there's lots of partner like community partnerships that have been established, lots of programs. I know Debbie briefly touched on the sensory room. So that's one too. It, it was a really great transition where the previous intern kind of secured the grant funding for the sensory room just in time for when I started and I was hired, one of my first projects was to make the sensory room. And that was a really, really fun project. So um, that's a great place that has gotten nothing but amazing reviews, like uh, the public loves them, lo loves the room. So that's been a really great project. Um, and another thing is programming. So with library social workers, obviously, like we've touched time and time again, every community is different. And so library social workers have the opportunity to create programming based on the needs that they see in the community. And so one of the needs that I saw early on was kind of 
the fact that there was a little that, that there was a bridge there, there was a uh not a bridge but more so a gap between the relationships with staff and folks that are either experiencing homelessness have behavior issues have mental health issues and so i started a coffee and conversation program it's kind of a, a unique model that a lot of library social workers do across the country but it really is just to bring folks of all different backgrounds together in a space to talk about all kinds of things and it's a really great community builder and relationship builder and and sometimes even the biggest preventative for future behavior issues because folks that work in the library and folks that use the library already have those established relationships and that rapport with each other to kind of avoid some future instances that may happen. Um, some key um, community partnerships towards the beginning, I would say very early on when I started, I secured a partnership with the American Heart Association. So what happened was they provided us with the education, the infographics, the material, and the library purchased blood pressure kits. So we purchased a blood pressure monitor, um, some like clear boxes so that we can add those to our Beyond Books collection. And so now folks are able to check out blood pressure kits to be able to check their blood pressure at home, have those conversations with their family, with their doctors. And it really was just something to help meet uh, health goals and um, meet those gaps in the in the community community as well. Another one is through NAMI. We, um, they, they hosted some educational trainings for staff. So that was pretty neat so that staff can also have a heightened awareness too of a lot of issues that happen in the library because a lot of our incident reports typically were of folks who had mental health issues or behavioral issues. And so learning how to navigate that from the other side of what a mental illness looks like, looks like what the um, the signals are, what are some tools that you can use to kind of help in those situations. Um, those are really great educational opportunities for staff. Um, another pretty neat program, a very recent one, was through the county. They provided us with free mobile hotspots, and so that is just meant to bridge the digital divide in the community. So it's free mobile hotspots that's good for two years of free internet, and the only qualifying factor is if you don't have internet at home. So typically now staff know that if there are patrons who come in and they're on a long wait list for the hotspot that's in our Beyond Books collection and they express that they don't have internet, they're usually referred to me and then we complete that questionnaire, that process, and then they get internet. So that's also another great service. And I know partnerships with the university or college has also been mentioned. And those are also really great and important because when we talk about funding and if there isn't enough funding, but you still wanna have those connections and those services provided into the community, um, it's really, it, it's great to take advantage of those partnerships that can happen. For instance, the nursing program also at Carthage College, we partnered with them and they had their students complete their clinicals here once a week where they conducted free health screenings of all types and education on health at the library. And those were pretty well attended as well. So, and I know Debbie spoke a lot about the social work partnership that we have as well, that we host interns, already had two of them. And it's been a great partnership because not only is it a great help for me, but it's also a great learning opportunity for them. Because again, like I said, library social work is one of those unique careers where it's all three, where it's micro, meso, and macro. And it's a great opportunity for students to have all three of those experiences in one. Um, and lastly, another one is Lyft Wisconsin. They're a driver's license clinic, and they also offer other legal support. They reached out to me just to have to meet those needs of the community because they saw that there were a lot of um, just issues with folks not being able to have updated driver's licenses, whether that was financial issues or just court issues. Um, and so they are a, they now host those monthly pop-up clinics and those usually get booked up really, really quickly as well. So these are just a few of the highlighted ones that I have, but obviously there are a ton more that have come about um, that are still worth mentioning, but um, we wouldn't have enough time because a lot has happened in the past two-ish years. Um, so yeah, those are just some, some of my favorite ones personally. And then on a macro level, like I said, policy-wise, um, I am a part of the leadership team here, and the leadership here is, I believe, six folks um, that are in, on leadership level here at the library. And so we have a regular review of all of our policies, but most important to note is um, the rules of behavior policies. That's one I've kind of had like a heavy eye on and heavy hand in and kind of like 
challenging what is what was existing in those policies and asking the why, like why is this the way it is and why can't we do it this way to be more equitable um, for to serve folks in the community. And so a big part of that is stressing to staff and to leadership that different behavior is not necessarily dangerous behavior. We know that um, in the library world, there's a lot of, there's many types of incidents that can happen. And although training is very, a very important piece of the puzzle, so is the changing the biases of staff and changing the way that staff interact with and deal with and deescalate situations as well. And also having an emphasis on bias trainings and trauma-informed care can also help staff to, to feel empowered and to have more tools in their toolkit to be able to deal with those situations on top of making more equitable policies. And again, too, that goes hand in hand with banning procedures, asking the questions of who, who is affected most by the procedures in place when we are suspending or banning patrons. And often those that are banned are those that need the services the most. So how can we mitigate that? How can we have a middle ground of keeping a safe environment while also having that trauma-informed care and providing the best care for each patron that walks in, into our, our building? Um, a part of that, when we are when we were reviewing our behavior policies and our banning procedures, a big piece of the conversation was um, security in general. We used to have a security agency that we had contracted, and at the end of last year, we actually ended that contract, and now we have public safety specialists. So instead of it being a contracted agency outside of the library, our public safety specialists are in-house, so they are hired by the library. And so they are part of our staff. They take part in our trainings. They get our e like library emails. And um, it's more of a person strength based goal. It's, it's more so of relationship building with patrons rather than just being a security guard, just guarding in case a rule is broken. It's more so of those one on ones and also helping folks, referring them to myself, referring them to other information in the library so that, again, that relationship building often is one of the biggest preventatives to having those bigger issues in the future. So that's so far has worked for us. Um, and so far, I think has it's just a step in the right direction to creating more equitable practices in the library. Um, and I just added my cool infographic. Um, this is kind of what we have at the service desks for folks to see. Um, I kind of have like just like a generic information on what I can help out with, the basic programs that I run that are just like access points for the bus passes and the hotspots, um, and then just important information. So this is just, again, something that I implemented, I believe, late last year. And I believe that's also why this year maybe it's been a little bit busier is because now we actually have physical um, information on my role here. But again, it's it's very important to market that you have a social work intern, social worker, a community specialist, so that folks in the community know and take advantage of that. I do think it's uh, good to note too what Ashley had added on the bottom of her info sheet, which is that we are mandated reporters. And I know in the state of Wisconsin, that's different for librarians versus um, social workers. And some states, so, uh, librarians are mandated reporters. But so we, we do have to inform um, the pro appropriate people if someone is going to hurt themselves or others. So that is, uh, it is helpful for people to know that. And that's why, you know, social work is a good, social worker is a good term to refer to us as and everything, because it does kind of help people understand that that is potentially a component of something that could happen. And we've unfortunately, I mean, I'm sure you, I, I, we haven't necessarily talked about it, but I'm sure you've had to make some reports as well as I have. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Similarly to Ashley, I do um, the similar um, macro work where we're working on policies. Um, we do um, jump back to the data slide is fine, Deb, it's fine. Um, uh, the community connections as well. And that light case management as well is something that I adhere to as well. And this is a little bit of what that looks like. I do think it's really great that we are in such an approachable place. Um, a lot of people have had bad experiences with social workers in their lives, you know, or, you know, whatever type of government system, they've had bad experiences and libraries are a safe place. And that's part of the reason why some of us have been really drawn to them and why people come there because it is a safe haven. And, you know, it, it's just wonderful that we have an opportunity there to be able to show people, okay, this could be a little bit different. We can get through some of these challenges in maybe a little bit different way. And uh, there's pros and cons to that. Um, we are not like, 
contracted with them, right? So some people may have had experiences in the past where like, hey, if you don't do it, you know, A, B, and C, your kids are going to get taken away, right? Like things like that have happened. But with us, if they don't do A, B, and C that we suggest to them or whatever, well, you know, they just don't happen, you know? So there's some natural consequences for them probably, but, you know, people can typically come back. We have, we have our limits, of course, but um, there's a lot of times where our services are just more approachable and just a little bit, uh, I think easier for some people to get on board with because of the fact that they are completely in the driver's seat with these goals. Um, this is a little bit of what I have worked with people on. I had to shrink my typical graph because I just have so many different categories that I try to show people. Um, and those are listed on the bottom, but these are typically the typically the highest ones here. Um, as you can see, housing is the number one thing that people come to me um, for help with. Um, it is just, it's huge, whether it is trying to find a place, um, whether it is um, trying to prevent losing uh, their place, if it's um, trying to get help with figuring out what housing lists they might be able to partake in. It's a lot, you know, that we that I, I spend my time on there trying to figure out how to make that more efficient. But uh, there's a lot of time there. Bus passes, um, ever since we started doing that, has definitely been a huge thing as well. Um, as you can see, there's a number of other categories um, that I won't go deep into. Um, my trends, so I am only showing you guys actually the data from this year because as Deborah had mentioned earlier, it has been a weird few years. I started in 2019, um, so I was just getting the ball rolling, and then the pandemic happened, and you know our services greatly changed. And then here in Eau Claire, we moved to a temporary location for a while, and now we're back. So since um, September of last year, we've been back downtown, and boy, has it been completely different ever since then. And um, I've had a lot, a lot, a lot of contacts. Um, I had my reprieve month, like typically in the summers, I noticed like there's tends to be a, a point in time where I get a little bit of a reprieve. Um, so I finally had that in September of this year, but it has been um, very intensive. I mean, I had one point in time where I had 27 contacts in one day in January because it just was that busy. Um, and there's just high needs. And um, I'm sure the libraries are seeing that as well, that ever since the pandemic has happened, there's more disparity, more concerns, more people that are struggling to make ends meet. And I'm definitely seeing that. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the different things that I do want to be mindful of time. Um, some of these things are things that I do. Some of these things are things that other libraries do. And I'll try to be clear about which ones um, I do and uh, which ones other social workers have done. Um, this is mostly all things that we have going on here in our library in Eau Claire. Um, I have my own RA display. Um, I got this idea from Tracy, who is um, a former colleague of ours who unfortunately passed away this year, but she um, did this great RA display where she would say, okay, I'm going to do a, um, a display on a particular topic. And she actually invited in a social service provider every month on that theme to come table, which was, is very cool. Um, I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I just include resource information regarding whatever that topic is. So for example, this last month was substance use. And um, this was probably my most... Um, use display so far. I've had most of the materials are all gone. Uh, this was probably three times as many books as that before at the beginning of the month. Um, and then I included information regarding, you know, AA meetings, NA meetings, that kind of thing for people. Um, I have some different agencies come in on a regular basis for housing support, for work support, that sort of thing. Um, I wasn't, I'm not the exact coordinator of this, but I do want to give people that idea that we do have a legal clinic on a monthly basis at our library. Um, and then I also host a book club on a monthly basis as well. And that book club is meant to kind of create community conversation. It gives me a little chance to have a different type of audience that I see as well. Um, but it gives me a chance to talk to uh, the community members about hard things and hopefully create community change around that. Um, housing and shelter. Um, I hear, like I said, I have individuals come in from... Um, housing, like homeless serving agencies, there we go, um, to help support people as well and get people connected to what we call rapid rehousing lists, things like that, so that people can hopefully get out of homelessness quicker. Um, if you don't have a social worker, like that's part of why I'm giving you lots of ideas here is that you don't necessarily have to have a social worker to do some of these things. Um, you could have someone from the housing authority come in, you could have someone from the shelter come in or whatever else it may be to help get people connected to housing and shelter support. Uh, moving on to food, um, 
And this is also somewhat social too as well, because uh, Ashley had mentioned coffee and conversation is a wonderful model that some agencies use. I haven't been able to do it yet. I was all ready to start doing it when the pandemic happened and I just haven't been able to jump back into it yet. But I've seen libraries have little free libraries that are dedicated to food. I've seen libraries have um, a shelf space that's dedicated to a little pantry in their library. Uh, we did, during part of the pandemic, we did grab and go bags of um, pantry food that we worked with a food pantry on to have just ready to go so customers could take them as they walked out the door if they needed to, again, to help meet some of those needs. So if you're thinking, gosh, we hear a lot of people that ask like about food and food resources, maybe these are some things that you might want to consider. Um, something I forgot to add on here too is, you know, maybe it's having someone come in to help people sign up for food share on a regular basis. That's a big one that I spend a lot of time on uh, getting people connected to. So those are vital, critical needs, housing and food, right? And then as we're thinking a little bit up uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, different types of things that might be things we want to intervene with and address, health and physical literacy. This is actually a huge growing part of, from what I've seen, of um, library, the library world is how can we engage people with different types of literacy? Um, I have seen libraries do things like STD clinics, or like I said before, walk-in therapy, wellness checks, getting blood pressure checks done. We did some vaccine clinics here. We worked with the health department to have some vaccine clinics done, um, that kind of thing. Uh, yoga, exercise classes, there's all sorts of different things that can be done here. Um, I had an intern that did some take-home kits for kids that were based on a emotional regulation activity that kids could color and take home and all of that. So it's again, you know, there's different ways that these partnerships can happen. Um, my intern also had some great ideas for a new checkout kit that was based on like sensory toys so that people can get a feel for what types of sensory toys might they want. Things like, you know, weighted vests and all these other things can be really expensive things. And if a family wants to try it out and see if they like it before they buy it, um, that would be really cool. So consider that there's um, maybe some opportunities for some different types of kits to help um, families in different ways. Um, occupational, uh, there's, we have someone come in from workforce resource on an every other week basis to get people signed up for workforce resource programs. A lot of people don't know that there is tons of funding in workforce resource in the state of Wisconsin right now, um, especially for families. They're giving people a thousand dollars. If someone doesn't have a GED or an HSED, they're giving people a thousand dollars to do that if they're a parent. Like that's amazing. That's, you know, there's all these huge programs that um, people don't realize that there's a lot of money for or for job retention bonuses for families too and things like that. So workforce resource is a really cool resource. And if you have someone nearby-ish, is my strong hint to maybe see if you want to have that person come and partner with your library on um, helping connect people because the workforce is still struggling to recover since the pandemic. And um, a lot of people are having a hard time finding the right fit that's beating their needs after everything that's happened and continuing to happen with, um, you know, COVID, like, people are still getting COVID and being out for a week and all these other things are happening and kids getting sick and all that. So um, it's, there's a lot of opportunities for your library to work with people to uh, to to do occupational work. Um, there's a lot of you know different types of staffing agencies and things like that as well out there that might be able to work with you, even if it's just putting a flyer up. There's a lot of things that can be done to help support people in this area. Um, substance use. Um, we know this is a growing trend and a growing concern for a lot of libraries and a lot of communities. Um, if you have a meeting room space, maybe consider things like does our policy maybe exclude things about 12 step meetings because maybe they want a private space and maybe your policy says something about like, you know, they have to be able to be open meetings or something like that, right? Like consider what does your policy say and is this a space where people would feel safe hosting a 12 step meeting? Um, I have done some work in providing information at optimal points because a lot of the recovery process is change readiness. So considering that maybe people aren't ready yet to make some steps, but knowing what's out there is a big part of getting ready to make those steps. So I put brochures in the stacks. This is actually our old stacks, um, but I put brochures in the stacks that uh, had the AA meetings, the NA meetings, as well as the smart recovery meeting information on it so that people would have that. They could, you know, if they were ready for it. And again, if people are at that contemplation, contemplative stage, that's kind of an optimal point to catch people on that. Um, also consider, you know, there's some libraries that could do different types of risk reduction efforts, like hosting a naloxone training for your community or whatever else it may be. Um, 
there's a lot there. Making sure your sharps containers have locks, that's huge as well. Work with your police departments, work with everybody else. There's a lot that can be done there. Um, briefly, resources. Um, again, passive resources are a really great way to help connect people, um, This either for staff or for customers, um, having resources where people can grab them because maybe they're not ready to talk to a social worker yet, or maybe there never will be, you know, but a way to get people information about critical things uh, can be really, really helpful. So we had... Um, this resource sheets developed to help with uh, with connecting to people. And we are getting very short on time here. It is two o'clock. So does anybody have any questions for us? Um, here's our contact information as well if you'd like to reach out to us uh, for asking us anything. We are all happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. And um, I learned a ton just from listening to it. I'm going to hang out for a few minutes here. If folks do have questions, please, um, if, if Ashley, Debbie, Libby, if you have a couple minutes, um, we can just see if there's any pressing questions for folks that are on the call. Um, and I will pause here and, and let if you want to unmute or put it in chat, we'd be happy to take your questions. but also totally understand if you need to hit the road, it's two o'clock. <laughs> There's a lot of information we tried to squeeze in that hour. <laughs> it was amazing. I am, I'm, I'm absolutely astounded by how much you shared with us. So it does look like folks are logging off mm -hmm. for the day. Oh, Charles has a question. Have you received any pushback or resentment from regular library patrons? Yes. I mean, there's always people who don't like things. I mean, I don't know how to say that other than that. It's just there's always people who don't like something. Um, and it's a challenge. But, you know, I focus on the people who do like us. <laughs> you know, we've had a lot of people who I've had people who just pop into my office and they're like, you're doing amazing work. Here's $20 for your program. You know, like it's just like that's that's the cool stuff. You know, we get to hear a lot of people that just are excited about it. And that's what I really try to focus on. Um, for the individuals that aren't ready, I just simply try to, you know, encourage them to, you know, continue to come back to the library and have an open mind and see, you know, the positive work being done. And, you know, sometimes they don't know everything going on behind closed doors and all the challenging work that's happening there. So, yeah. Yeah, and I echo that. Um, towards the beginning of my employment here, the library marketed very heavily my new position. And so with that, on online discourse, you also get you get a lot of discourse on both sides. And so that was, I think that was like the only hiccup really, but it was just more so of like folks not agreeing that their taxpayer money is going towards this particular program. But exactly like Libby said, like now two and a half years in, or like like, yeah, over two years in, I just look at the numbers and that that's enough for me to really not worry about that because we we really do see that there is a great impact that we're having. So that's that's what matters at the end of the day. As a follow up to that in terms of impact, um, have you do you track any kind of staff feedback in terms of are they sharing with you that they feel that there's a difference in their kind of um maybe stress levels or ability to handle um, situations that have come up um, at the library? Gosh, I don't, we don't track staff feedback. I mean, I definitely, we, we track public feedback, but um, I totally forgot to mention too that, you know, I've done a fair amount of work with um, training staff or bring, you know, helping coordinate trainers to come in to train staff on different topics. And in my data, actually, over this last year, I've noticed a significant decrease in incidents that I've needed to respond to because my staff have been showing more and more and more that they're ready and able and confident in tackling different challenges in the library. And that's awesome. You know, it's it makes me feel good that they are that they're doing that. And um, I do hear things like I, I remembered what you said or things like that, you know, that those are the things that I hear that, um, you know, people remember different tips I've given them, given them or whatever else, and they've been more confident in handling challenges in the library, which is great. But yeah, I can't think of anything specifically though related to just what staff have said um, 
about us being here other than they always are say things like, you know, we missed you if I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anecdotal <laughs> evidence is very helpful. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, all right. Well, I should probably wrap things up here, but um, we do have your emails and contact information. It will go out with the um, slides and the recording for this. So I'm sure that if folks do have, yes, Charles will be sharing, sharing this link to the recording. Um, absolutely. Um, and if people do have maybe some individual follow-up questions, they can contact you via email or maybe a phone call and um, ask those questions. So um, I do want to thank the three of you for your presentation today. It was absolutely wonderful. And I want to thank people for attending and spending some time with us on this rainy Friday. Um, I do just want to wrap up by letting you all know that we have another Wheels World short coming up on Friday, November 17th, also at 1 p.m., in which you can hear about our own 36-hour full-time work week experiment. You can um, log You can log through that link there and uh, register for that if you're interested. Um, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. It was really delightful. It's great to see you, Ashley. Yes, you too.